so I've got, I've got to follow this folks. Um, welcome to the virtual meeting. This is a formal council committee. The proceedings will take place live on the internet. Oh Lord, they've seen us. Um, it doesn't say that in the brief. Um, the meeting will be, will be recorded for future viewing. It will assist the conduct of business if participant, part, participants speak when invited. All participants should mute their microphones and turn off the video feed when they are not speaking. Apparently I'm supposed to have my video feed on when I'm speaking. Didn't realise that. Um, members of the public, we haven't got any members of the public as far as I can see. Yeah. All right. Um, so they're welcome to view the proceedings, but they, don't, they can't make any contributions at the meeting. Please remember to unmute your microphone and switch on your video phone, video feed when it is your turn to speak. Speak clearly and slowly into your microphone. Um, actually, you can speak as you normally speak. Anyone wishing to speak should in indicate using the raise your hand button um, and I'll invite people to speak at the appropriate time. Um, Steve or Karen will help me with that. If, I, if there's lots of people suddenly stick their hands up, we'll get round to you because it does show on the screen as to who's put their hands up. But if we haven't got the hands up facility, we'll sort it. Don't worry. I've done a few of these anyway. Um, I ask for everyone's patience with the use of technology and I apologise in advance if I make a right mess of it. OK, and or if we experience any unforeseen difficulties. So now we've got the agenda item, but first thing I'd like to say is um, thank you all for coming. Um, and I really do hope that you and yours are all safe and well. Um, um, I think um, it, it's just been a horrible time for so many people. Um, and if we were if we were at a meeting, I think we'd stand up and, and have a minute silence. But actually, um, I don't, don't see the necessity for that at this time. Uh, I just think we should always bear in mind that we've got people out there who've died and people have been very poorly and a lot of people have done an awful lot of work um, to keep people as safe as possible you know and some people are giving their lives to do that so just remember that as we go along so first of all have we got any apologies for absence i know that i've got jake as an apology for absence any more um karen no further apologies chair thank you uh appointment of any substitute members i don't know whether we have uh, no chair we have. Uh, thank you uh declarations of interest and in the members of code of conduct can't see that there would be any, but anybody want to say now or no, we're all right, are we? OK, <clears throat> excuse me, to confirm the minutes of the meeting on the 23rd of January 2020. Um, does everybody agree that those minutes were a true record? Um, actually, say no if you think they weren't. OK, so the true record. Um, you'd usually pass me that book and I'd sign things now, but I'm not going to do that. Um, right now we've got um, We've got a few things on the agenda. I did send out before the meeting, if people remember, um, some things that we, we would have. Um, we've got the corporate quarterly performance report, which has been sent out to you. I also know that um, Karen and Jacqueline, who's new, a new officer who will introduce herself um, at some stage within this, um, have uh, come along to present something. So I think we're at the stage where um, Karen and Jacqueline uh, are going to make a verbal presentation. Is that right, Karen? Yes, Chair, Thank that's you. right. Thank yeah. you. OK, so initially um, I'm here obviously to present the quarter four performance report, which highlights the performance for the financial period 1st of April 19 to the 31st of March this year. Um, there are a total of 34 KPIs for the end of year report, 32 of which are reported on a quarterly basis and two of which we report on an annual basis. Of the 34 being reported tonight, we've got 18 that are on target and 11 that are below target. The remaining five are within tolerance. The 11 indicators below target are outlined in section two of the quarter four performance report on page six. Um, with a detailed account as to why they're below target, given on the separate briefing summary I've produced. Each of the narratives against those PIs below target have been provided by the relevant officers who hold responsibility for those PIs. Um, Chair, I'm aware that obviously the narratives are there. I don't intend to go through each of those PIs unless there's any that you want me to go through specifically. But I am aware that um, you made you focused you wanted to focus on two particular items, one being um, PI 2061, 
which is the one relating to the identifying and delivering of procurement savings. And I'm aware that Rose Younger, as the director of that service, is here to answer any questions on that one. And then the second one, as you've made reference to, was for Jackie Branch as the head of HR and OD to be here to um, give headline information on um, and by way of infographics on the COVID-19 situation and the challenges that's presented staff with. Um, and I'm also aware that Matt Williams has, has come along as well um, to give you a bit of a brief on the council's approach to the return into the workplace um, as we come out of COVID. So I'm not sure how you want to play that now, Chair, but um, obviously the relevant officers are here and happy to take any questions that you want at this stage. Right. Um, well, I think, first of all, um, can we do the procurement first? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. That's, With Rose. That's fine. Yep. Do you, want, right. do, do you just want me to explain it, Chair? I, I think if you could explain um, why we've missed the target or missing the target, yep. Uh, and then we can open it up to questions. I do know that this was something that was brought up by uh, some of the members of the committee to to bring forward anyway. OK, okay thank you. Yeah. So th there's, a, there's a number of reasons um, um, behind this, one of which is the contracting cycle, because clearly if we're not letting any contracts that we're not reporting um, any savings. That's w one point. Um, secondly, there, there is something about we, we overachieved in the previous quarter which is when a lot of contracts were let and underachieved in this quarter four, primarily because of COVID. Now, I realise some people will say, well, we didn't enter lockdown until uh, the two thirds of the way through March. However, um, we were very aware that there was a problem with the procurement or the availability of PPE from the national stocks um, well before that. And so I gave an instruction to my uh, my procurement team, which is the kind of corporate procurement team, to cease all norm normal procurement activity and focus entirely on um, the procurement of PPE. Um, um, and that PP was to supplement the stocks that were uh, coming or supposedly coming from the LRF, the Local Resilience Forum, um, but was going to support care homes um, in the main um, and domiciliary care workers uh, to start with, but also our staff. So a lot of work was done on that way back into, into February, actually. Um, and the third point is that when... Um, those of you who've known me since I got here, um, when, when I was asked to set up a commercial and procurement department, um, uh, I developed the chief officer's um, uh, plan and developed some um, performance indicators. With the benefit of hindsight, this this particular performance indicator should probably be an annual one. So I think reporting it, it on a quarterly basis is probably not right because of what I said earlier about the contracting cycle. Um, so that's just a bit a bit of background. If you want more detailed information, obviously I'll I'll, I'll um, ask m members of the committee to to let me know what they want, and I can give you a, you know a report with the actual detail that you're looking for. Over to you, Chair. Thank you. I just have to remember to unmute myself and uh, not something that I'm used to, to be quite honest. Uh, right. Uh, anybody who'd like to raise any points, please. Beck. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Rose. Thanks ever such a lot um, for, for that. Um, just in terms of that particular measure, I was just wondering whether now we're in a new sort of world in terms of, um, you know, going forward, we're going to need more resources uh, for the council just in terms of, you know, just looking at PPE, for example, as one one key thing that we're definitely going to need more of going forward. I'm just wondering how viable that actual measure will be in itself, because, you know, if you're measuring last year, to this year's um, purchase of resources, then you're never going to make, you're never going to look like you're making the savings. So that's my first point. And then the second point is, um, yeah, how, how are we sort of looking to make savings? Are we looking to sort of lower standards on certain purchases or um, 
you know, because obviously if we're doing sort of um, contracts from the council's perspective, what we want to make sure is that people who are employed by the companies who do the contracts for us, they have good workers' rights, paid, um, certainly um, a living wage, that sort of thing. So I'm just wondering what are we sort of looking at to make the savings, please? Thanks. Chair, do you just want me to, to, to step in at this point? Yeah, take, take one at a time, otherwise okay. it gets a bit too complicated. Okay, thank you. Um, 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 Councillor Gentle, thank you. I mean, obviously it is a new world and the point that you make about PP is a really good one. I, I think we we all know now that um, what we thought, what I thought was going to be a short term um, crisis and us needing to get PPE for a period of three, six months. I think we all know now that that's going to be a significantly longer requirement um, of possibly 18 um, months, maybe even more. Um, the I, I, I'm still not getting any clarity from uh, the national um, reports about uh, I, uh, uh, whether at some point in the future the government are going to step in on their white charger and supply PPE and I won't need to do it anymore, which would be lovely. Um, but um, I don't think that's going to happen. I think we will need to continue to procure PPE for the foreseeable future. What we've been doing to be able to... Um, manage uh, the work within the West Midlands is the West Midlands Heads of Procurement have formed a group um, and what we've done is we've each taken the lead for certain items so from memory Wolverhampton are leading on masks, uh, Birmingham are leading on gloves, we're leading on aprons and body bags which I know is not really um, uh, at PPE but has been a requirement um, so we've been sharing out the workload um, between us. So that group has now settled into a fairly um, uh, business as usual kind of approach that's no longer um, uh, crisis driven. Because we're procuring across um, the West Midlands, we are able to also um, uh, uh, um, she says, hopefully get better prices, leverage better prices because of the greater volume. And at the beginning of the crisis, of course, it also meant that we could get stuff air freighted in with that kind of volume. So that's just a, a bit of background in, into what, what we've been doing. The point that you make about um, savings um, is also a, a, a good one, because I think as some of you may know, there's been lots of government advice in the form of um, PPNs, procurement policy notes, and there's been, I think, four of them to date. And those policy notes were designed for councils, public bodies to continue to pay those suppliers who I identified as being at risk, um, in, in short, to, to support the economy um, uh, and, the, and the payment of workers. Um, the latest uh, procurement policy note um, does ask um, contracting authorities, local authorities, to revisit um, their contracts and consider those which need uh, continue to be needed. So what that's about is about us saying in a um, post-crisis um, world, um, so as we go into BAU with COVID, um, will there be ch changes needed to be made to our contracts, some of which may need to be varied and the requirement reduced or changed potentially, and some of our contracts actually may need to be increased. And so, for example, if you're thinking of um, uh, home to school transport, where it may be a taxi might have picked up two young people, that may now no longer be possible because of social distancing. Um, so I, th I think we will need to completely revisit um, all of our contracts um, in, in, in the next period. Um, and actually, you know, I think the savings element will need to, to, to wash out of that review work. Um, the, the point that you make about employing local people, etc., apprenticeships and so on and so forth, um, is what I describe as, as social value criteria. And I think, again, we will need to revisit, revisit that work. We already um, evaluate contracts and procurement on a number of things 
price, quality, and social value criteria. Um, and the per percentages allocated to those change um, and are reviewed by our procurement management group um, and assessed by a procurement manage management group. Um, and sometimes it's appropriate to award more points to um, social value and, and which w I would include the local supply chain, local economy, etc. Um, and sometimes it isn't. And, and the price variance as well, um, given um, that sometimes, not always, but sometimes buying things locally might be more expensive. And then we need to understand what the value of giving it to a local company is, is again, a, against um, a, a non-local company. And as an example, if you were buying an item for, say, £400 from a local company, um, and it was 350 from a, a non-local company, you you would um, you, you you would argue that the local company is the better deal. If you then took that to 3,500 um, for a non-local company and 4,000 for a local company, that's probably a good deal. But if you're talking about 3.5 million as against 4 million, then that might be the time when you say actually the difference in cost means that we've we've got to look at the uh, the non-local supplier. And, and it is never as black and white as that, and Beck. It is always far more complex than that. But um, the, there's a, a, a kind of value um, localism um, uh, algorithm um, a, a calculation that, that we need to make. And I think that's something that we will need to um, get smarter on in, in this post-COVID world, as we obviously will need to seek to support the local economy and develop the local economy and support recovery in Dudley Borough. The end. Thank, thank you, Rose. I, I think that was really quite interesting. Um, Brian, did you want to come in or did you flick your video wrongly? No, right. Um, I just wanted to, I think, throw something in here. Um, we, we we did our um, oh, um, little group, didn't we, when we were talking with you, Rose, about about these issues. Um, and um, um, to me, there's a certain element of a political question around the social value as well. And um, at the moment, I don't know. I'm not a cabinet member. Um, it are the politicians involved in the discussions around how we value social value at the moment or is this very much coming new and and being sort of worked on by the officers and then would you then be giving examples of how social value was worked into the system um, as you go along um thank you chair um I mean, clearly there is uh, um, th this law that sits behind social value, that, um, uh, which is uh, the uh, Social Value Act 2012, I believe, if, uh, if I'm correct. Um, uh, so this has been in, in place for some time. Um, when when you when you mention members and you remember that when we had th that that group that we discussed in January which doesn't it doesn't feel like that long ago um and we talked about and I think one of the outputs from that was that I was going to arrange some training for members um some procurement training and I think actually that would be really um helpful because I think there's there's often misconceptions about social value we've got a young man called Sam Turner who's our head of um service for procurement he's excellent um he knows all the rules far better than I do and between us well I started it off uh, with um training officers and uh, and then he did the bulk of the work to be fair but maybe what we could do is take that training and um uh amend it to be suitable for members um, and perhaps we test it first on on um, on this on this scrutiny group I think I'd welcome that because um, for me the, the the social value aspect of it in this sort of covid world because we're not in a post covid world by any means yet um, and you know I, I've been at a meeting today in a community center and looking at um, what we want to do and how we'll involve local firms in what we want to do and local suppliers uh, because that's what we want to do and that what we desperately need to do um, and I think for me 
I don't understand enough about this. Uh, although we had our little group, I still don't, don't understand enough about this. Uh, and yet there is an awful lot of value uh, to me in us understanding it, because very often stuff that comes down from the top of, you know, from central government, um, we don't um, criticise enough. You know, we don't critically look at a lot of the laws which are placed upon us, uh, both in the planning world where we've got so many um, difficulties that counts, local councils have with the planning world. We've now got this where um, for many of us, we desperately want local firms to be used whenever we can. Um, and I do understand that when you get to such huge amounts of money, you have to really, really look at it. Um, but the best value concept uh, can mean an awful lot of things, can't it? You know, if that best value is the fact that in, a, in an area of, of Dudley, which has high unemployment rates, we can provide a, a small level of employment by procuring locally, then that value is huge because it has that knock on value throughout, doesn't it? That may not be measured by the social value. So I, I would definitely welcome this committee learning more about that. Um, Brian, did you want to come in? You'd have to switch off your mute button. Brian, can you see your mute button? Actually, if you want to, if you want to come in, wave your hand quick. In reality, your real hand. OK, no. Yes. OK, Un unmute yourself. See the little microphone. It's got it's got a line through it at the moment in front of you. Yes. Unmute. That's yes. it. You're done. Well done, man. Yes, uh, I'm contented to speak on this, but since it has been raised in the PPE, um, the government seems to be, and it has been a question on, on news as well, where the government has gone overseas to buy PPE. Are there any firms locally in Dudley making the, the PPE? We've heard some, some of the local firms interviewed, but are there any firms in Dudley actually making it? Thank you, Brian. Yeah, yes, there are. Um, uh, Thomas Dudley have been making um, visors, both for ourselves and for CCG and, uh, and the local NHS. So that's one that I can reel off the top of my head because I've been having conversations with them. And in fact, um, what, what, what I've done is introduce them to the rest of the West Midlands Heads of Procurement Group. So I, um, I understand they're also supplying some of the other authorities in the West Midlands. More than that, I couldn't give you off the top of my head, but I can um, and I can have a look if you like. The, the problem that we've got, being blunt, is that, um, the mask, the visors are quite easy to make. Um, uh, the aprons are quite easy to make because it's extruded plastic and you just need to reset machines. The difficult things to make are gloves and masks and and the problem with the masks is that nobody in the UK currently makes the material which I understand is a plasticized material to stop droplet transmission through the mask nobody makes that in the UK it, 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 it my understanding is the only manufacturer is in the far east um, I, what I do know is that the Scottish government are pump priming um, a, uh, a manufacturer of that um, material. And I've been in discussion with Corinne Crane um, of the Black Country Chamber of Commerce to see what we could do to develop a supply chain. And the idea that I had that I discussed with him was that um, when I used to run companies, so I always think about what's, what's the unique selling point. And for me, the unique selling point, it would be um, us developing a local supply chain for either for sustainable PP, recyclable or reusable, um, because that would have not just national uh, market, but global market. So Corinne's gone away to to um, investigate that with um, an innovation group called Entrus in, I think they're in Wolverhampton, based in Wolverhampton University. So that probably doesn't answer your question exactly, Councillor Cottrell, but hopefully um, that helps. Thanks, Rose. Um, I've got um, Simon, you've got your hand up. Um, Brian, can you switch your video off now and, you, and, your, um, and take your hand down, please? Simon? Hello. Uh, 
Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, it's just to uh, quickly mention something on um, the social value comment and about getting local businesses involved. Um, obviously, there was the the, um, the scrutiny uh, committee working group that um, worked with Rose and the recommendations being taken forward on local businesses. But even before that as well, we were thinking about the best ways of trying to make sure that we could get out to local businesses to give that added social value in the procurement process. Um, one of the administration's priorities was to make sure that our procurement policies were reformed to make it much e much more easier for local businesses to be able to get through the bidding process. And that whole regime has now changed, and you know, particularly on the lower value contracts, um, it's much easier for, for businesses to be able to deal with us than what it was previously when they were trying to bid for work from, from Dudley Council. Um, of course, the next stage of that is all the things that the scrutiny committee that was contributing towards, which is making sure that they just know that the opportunities are there and getting that out to local businesses. So that's something that definitely is work in progress and continues on. Um, and then the other thing is specifically on social value itself and the way that it sort of like it makes up um, the procurement uh, tenders and, and, and our evaluation of, of each per person that's tendered for a deal. So uh, essentially the social value will have a percentage ascribed to it um, and businesses th that can prove that they can invest in the local um, area, invest in specific areas if it's possible as well and provide um, jobs, apprenticeships and investment into the Dudley Borough in, in places that is good for our, um, good for our economy. That will all give businesses the um, added benefit of scoring more higher on the social value parts of those contracts. And a lot of that is much more governed by, I think, national rules um, and, and laws and things that are set, which is certainly something that I think the scrutiny committee could have a look at. Um, and I'd be interested to actually, actually be able to, to learn more about that and, and the things that are set by government and the things that are set by Dudley Council as well. So those are the, the two different aspects, I suppose, of making sure local businesses have got access to air procurement process and then the social value itself. But it's certainly something that's on my radar as a cabinet member and always, you know, willing to take feedback on board. And um, I think it was a good, good topic for discussion in the future. Cheers. Thanks, Ed. You've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It was just a, a question about um, payment terms for, for local suppliers. I just wondered what they were uh, and whatever they are, can we reduce them further if possible? Obviously, we're, we're coming out of the furlough scheme now or, or it's been reduced and, and cash flow, obviously, to local businesses is absolutely critical. It could, you know, um, keep them afloat. So I just wondered what, what the terms were that we're paying on. Thank, thank you. I, I think that's a a really pertinent question. Um, I, I don't know if Rose will know the answer to that one though. I, I, I know some of it, probably not in, in, in the way that, that, that you're expecting. When I got here, one of the things that I've done in other authorities is in, involved a, a, a company that have helped us to pay local suppliers um, more more quickly um, and for that you get they, they, they negotiate a discount with the suppliers um, and when I tried to do that here I was told um, well we already pay our suppliers in 10 days and so I wasn't able to actually in, even introduce that thinking here so my understanding is that we pay if the invoice is correct um, and reflects the purchase order properly that we pay in 10 days from from point of invoice so um i i can get the exact information for you if you like from finance but that's what that's the information that i know well and being honest if that's the case then i think that's great uh you know and i've got to say um that our finance department overall has always been pretty good you know i mean we do very well on a number of factors um the final bit for you then, Rose, I've actually got two things. One's going to be really, really cheeky. Um, we've had a meeting in our local community centre today about um, providing meals for kids uh, over the summer break. And um, a, a young lady, Bri Brioni, from um, the uh, public health side is going to be getting in touch with you or Sam, actually, to see one way where they can get some litre bags of um, uh, gunk, you know, the... Um, what's it called the sanitizing stuff uh, and apparently sam can get those because uh, they're 70 quid to buy a bag 
but you can get refills for them. Uh, and the other thing is to see whether we can get some um, plastic um, gowns for people so we can actually get this food done. So I will be grabbing all of you at some stage for that very cheekily. Um, but the other thing is this actually this PI was to identify and de deliver procurement savings. And that was something that was we had a bit of an argument. I thought let's put it like that at the council tax um, way back. It would have been last year now. Um, the two political parties uh, and it was a bit of a humdinger that we had. I think it was last year or the year before. And, and really, I thought that this PI was there originally to, because we developed um, a new uh, part of, of, the, of the council to look specifically at the way we procure things and see whether we can develop savings from them. I've deliberately allowed tonight to be focused on the current situation of COVID because I think that's where we should be looking. But I think at some stage it'd be worth coming back to this in a future meeting to see um, how you've used new practices to see whether we can we can actually deliver better value. Uh, obviously taking into account the social value side of it, but to deliver that better value that we hoped, well, that was hoped to be got out of that budget round, if you get what I mean. Um, in other words, to see, are you getting the biggest bang for the book that you can out of this? But just at this moment, I do want everybody to be able to concentrate on, on the task at hand. So I'd like to thank you um, for input into this. Um, and um, for me, I, I, I actually can't see where else we'd bring this item of business to any other committee. I just don't see how we would. And I think it'd be really useful um, to have put into the programme over the next six to nine months, the training that you were talking about, how can we do that? And actually we need to bring back um, the report from our working group uh, about you know how do we as councillors actually get out there on the streets can't do it at the moment obviously um, with local businesses to, to get them in, more involved in in procuring the massive amount of business that we've got so thank you very much and you can you can go home if you wish to <laughs> okay thank you right thank you chair okay bye bye and thanks very much for all you're doing okay right uh Karen what was um we've got is it yeah so yeah. I think the, the second thing that um, chair that you asked um, to focus on um, was the headline information relating to COVID-19 um, by way of sort of infographics. So that was looking at sort of how we've coped with the challenges of COVID, particularly relating to staff and what impact that has had in terms of sickness figures, numbers working from home, etc. So Jackie Branch is actually here to um, to cover that item for you. So I'll hand over to Jackie at that point, if that's OK. Yeah. And if Jackie, if you could give, because it's the first time you've been in this committee and, and I didn't, I did, you know where I'm like, people will know around this table that I have a great deal of difficulty in recognising people uh, uh, until I've seen them about 20 times. And remembering their names is very difficult. So Kevin particularly will understand that. Um, but if you can just give a quick re resume of who you are and what you're doing and then um, launch into the topic, please. Thank you, Chair. I do indeed, uh, Chair. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good evening, members. Yes, this is my first time at Corporate uh, Scrutiny Committee. Um, some of you will have come across me already because I've been here since the end of January 2019, and I am the uh, Head of um, Human Resources and Organisational Development, and uh, Karen works as part of my team. So um, whilst I haven't been at Corporate Scrutiny before today, um, I have been um, aware of everything that's that's been coming to you in terms of um, from the performance performance uh, information and I also think you've had a couple of members of my team talking to you um, and explaining where we're at with that absence management. Um, so the reason I'm here tonight is to give you uh, some headline information, uh, real-time information actually, um, on the impact of um, COVID on the workforce. And there's three parts to this that I'd like to uh, focus on. First of all, I'd like to start with the um, employee survey. So I'm going to share that um, on, on the screen. So hopefully you can all, all see that now. I'm also going to take the opportunity to give you some headline information on um, uh, sickness during the, uh, the, the 
uh, lockdown period, and then some more generic information on um, workforce related matters. So what you have in front of you um, on the screen are the headline figures from our latest employee survey, which we undertook um, at, from the beginning of May and it closed at the end of May. So, so this is um, up to date information. Um, we thought it was really important just to take the temperature because um, as you will all be aware it has been quite a, it's been a difficult period for, for um, everybody not least um, uh, our workforce who many of whom have continued to work um, on the front line in difficult circumstances many who have had to to, 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 to work from home and others who've been deployed into jobs that they haven't uh, done before to, 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 to actually support um, you know the community response and, and the food bank and, and working with the voluntary sector. So we did this as a temperature check um, to get a sense of how our employees were feeling. So we had a response rate of uh, 2,074 and um, of those who responded, 90% um, um, had indicated that they are actually working from home, working remotely. Um, you will see from the information uh, on the um, infographic in front of you that uh, uh, we had a very good response in terms of how uh, our employees are feeling, particularly about how they have felt around um, how the council has treated, treated them during this period. Um, and also, you know, um, the fact that 89% uh, of respondents were proud of the work that they do every day and also that, you know, they know what's expected of them um, in their job. So that's all, all very positive um, feedback. Um, I think there was also a very strong sense of um, our strongest value um, that um, staff have, have felt uh, during this time is that uh, we're working together followed by um, determination and accountability um, as well as the fact that they felt that during this time uh, managers have continued to keep in touch with them and indeed have been in touch with them more regularly than before COVID so that's all all, all very positive and um, I think one of the lessons that um, we've learned from um, the, the COVID crisis and having to work differently and um, being more agile and having to work from home is what impact that that has had um, on, on our employees. Generally, it's been um, uh, mostly positive responses that we've had. Obviously, um, you know, there is a, um, uh, a view, 60 percent of the managers have um, changed their view of remote working for, for the better and would con and 73 percent would continue, continue to support more uh, re remote working. But interestingly, some of the figures in the in the um, kind of um, aqua box um, that, you know, people have felt that during this time their skills have improved. Um, they've uh, reported back that they've changed the way that they work that they feel their productivity has, has improved and that, you know, the majority of uh, employees who responded are embracing new ways of working, feel trusted to do their job and uh, feel that their colleagues are doing um, a really good work. Um, so just to, to, to kind of wrap up on this particular uh, infographic, um, we, we actually provided an opportunity for employees to provide um, freehand comments so, so they could write uh, whatever comments they wanted to um, at the end of, 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 of the um, survey. And we had, you know, almost four and a half thousand positive comments, which would have, um, you know, that that's quite um, a, a, a good response. And amongst those suggestions, um, um, have, have come forward in terms of how, um, you know, we can continue to support and encourage uh, um, uh, further remote working. So I'm going to pause there just in case there's any um, questions you wanted to um, ask in relation to the employee survey. Um, and um, there will be a more detailed report that will come to members. And we're literally um, pulling all of that data together at the moment. But these were just the headline figures. So that will follow. Um, but I'll pause, Chair, in case there's any questions there. And then I'll go on to the sickness absence and the, and the more uh, generic um, workforce stats, if that's OK. Unmute myself. <laughs> that was me. That was me rabbiting on. Right. Um, Actually, as any, if anybody hasn't got any comments or while they're thinking, um, I think it's a really, really good piece of work. Um, and um, 
I truly wish that in the civil service which I'm in, we'd started to do this piece of work as well. Um, because it has to be said, I mean, I'm one of um, the 95% of the people who work in HMRC who are currently working from home. And um, people have already, we've already mentioned this tonight, the furlough scheme, the self-employed scheme, a number of other schemes which have come out nationally. Uh, and the pride which I felt in our workforce in HMRC, you know, to actually deliver a computer system within a government department that works um, it is almost a miracle. And to have done it in the short period of time it's done. And I am really sad that we haven't got something like you've just presented to us. Because actually, um, this sort of data allows us, I think, as, a, as an organisation, as the council, to start really thinking about how our future can be. Uh, I know that I, I, the reason I, I asked for this was I actually um, had to make an appointment at the tip. And the lady I spoke to, um, it was really interesting to talk to her. I, I'm, I'm not a terrible thing to focus on one person. And I hope she, she I, don't, I don't remember her name, so I'm not going to say who it was. But what she said was that she worked in Dudley Council Plus, which can be a cold office in the winter. She had to park a car, walk across town to get there, and she got some disabilities. And she found that being able to work from home in a, in a, a temperature controlled room, um, she didn't have to make that awful journey across, across the town centre uh, in the rain and the wind. And she felt that her working life had substantially changed for the better. And I think the things that come across from that infographic, I think particularly that one which says 89% of staff feel trusted. Because that's the big leap of faith, isn't it? You know, um, that where 60% of managers have changed their view of remote working for the better, some of those views might well have been, can we trust people to get up with the work when they're at home? And actually, I think what that says is, yes, we can. So, you know, I think I, I really think it's um, a great piece of work and something, there's obviously a lot more behind that, as, you, as you've said, there's going to be another report. Um, and it'd be interesting to hear what... Um, Kevin feels of this, but um, Peter, you wanted to uh, come in. Pete? Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry it. about just clicking all, right. all the buttons. Yeah, what, what concerns me a little bit about the uh, remote working, is it not a little bit like um, ordering online? I know it's nothing to do with that, but like ordering online and this, the town started fade away you know what i mean like that sort of a situation where you don't need the council house anymore or you'd all be working from home that concerns me a little bit um about the fact that everybody's not i mean i appreciate what you just said chair on the fact that the lady having to struggle across car parks and especially in the bad weather dark nights and that sort of thing perhaps a special arrangement could be made for, for such people in that dilemma but it just worries me about this working from home i mean i particularly don't like these sort of meetings because you've you've not got the um you know the camaraderie sort of effect of you really that worries me a little bit um but it, it's got to be done at the moment obviously the situation we're in but uh, yeah that was that all that was my comment chair really thank you chris uh, and we'll come back to that, uh, Peter. Thank you. I think it's a very valid comment. Chris? Yeah, um, really part of what Peter is saying there and, and just, just a general comment on what's happening. I've, I've got a, a lot of time for um, remote working, uh, although working from home on a, a, a long term basis, is, there clearly can be issues of isolation. And, and I know that because I've been doing it for a very long time. Uh, however, uh, d d going going back to you know, maybe not working from home, but going to a place of work. Uh, it seems to me that this is an opportunity to, uh, as that be becomes to happen, uh, you know, going to a nearby building to work rather than all, you know, I don't know, going to the, the harbour building because that department works there. Uh, employees can... Uh, work at a building that's close to their home so you might have a mixture of what they're doing you know they're working for different departments but they've still got uh, a, a group of uh, um, colleagues around them so you know the isolation is reduced and um, they're still all working 
for Dudley Council, so that, that you know they have the uh, the camaraderie of working for the same business. Um, and uh, I, I I just kind of wanted to mention that it's it's something that I'm particularly interested in, and um, it, it doesn't entirely answer what Peter was talking about. Uh, you, you know that uh, you, you haven't got a department maybe working together as a team, um, but it, it you know I, I think we can get over those kind of things. Um, and uh, we, don't, we don't have to carry on working from home forever. Uh, but equally, I don't see why uh, we should just spring back into exactly what we were doing before, especially as uh, clearly from this infographic, you can see there's such a lot of um, uh, positive vibes around uh, what's been happening. And I, I too had a conversation with someone from the call centre, Tim, uh, who, uh, who gave me the same sort of feedback. She was very happy to be working from home and was really enjoying it. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. I've got uh, Ian, Ian Bevan. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, it's just an observation, really. I'm looking at this uh, infographic. There was sort of just over two and a half thousand, two and a, just over 2,000 responses. And yet the positive comments about remote working nearly four and a half thousand it's absolutely overwhelmingly in favor isn't it if if we can rely on this information and that, that just really stands out on on this infographic for me um as i say just an observation really thank you did somebody else did somebody else just say they wanted to come in then as well yeah if i could come in chair yeah um i, mean, I think it's really good that the staff feel that you know they can be trusted to do the job uh, and yes, there is positives and negatives with isolation, etc. I want to know how the work is monitored as well. So, you know, if, if they're given tasks, is it managers that monitor it, etc. So it would be interesting to see because I've found some cases that not all work is monitored. Thanks. Um, I've got nobody else um, saying anything. Um, Jack, Jacqueline, sorry. Yeah, Jacqueline. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I just hesitated with the name then. Jack yeah, Jack is fine. <laughs> sorry, yeah, anything. Jackie. Yeah, um, can you can you come back in, please? Yes, yes, okay. So if um th th thank you um for uh, um those comments and just to say that um after I finish the uh, infographics, there's two more uh, um, to take you through. Um, Matt Williams is um, able to give members an update on um, what we are doing in terms of um, getting that balance between people continuing to work from home, but also having the opportunity to come back into, into the workplace. And, and just on that, if I could just um, go to the um, first uh, infographic, um, maybe I should have started here, actually, um, and I'll just make it a little bit bigger. So because I'm conscious that the, the writing is quite small. Um, but just to let you know, um, obviously, the um, returns on the um, on, on, on the survey was um, just over uh, 2000 returns. But actually, of the um, uh, uh, 5,153 um, uh, employees um, that, that um, have um, been working during the um, lockdown. I should um, just say that 24% of those employees have continued to work on site. So um, just just need to to bear in mind that that obviously while we do have um, you know 38% of the workforce that have worked from home and a further um, um, 25% who were partially um, able to work from home. We had 24% of uh, our employees who have continued to work during the period. Um, we do have a, a, a smaller amount who were unable to work. Um, obviously, there were a number of our services that um, we haven't been able to continue to deliver in the way that we uh, would normally um, deliver that. So, i.e., um, you know, uh, catering and, and uh, parking management and leisure staff. However, what we have tried to do. Um, as far as possible is redeploy uh, those members of, of staff and we are actually slowly uh, returning to, to, to those functions um, as, as we move um, uh, out of lockdown. 
Other information that members will be interested in is the fact that we've continued to pay people each month. Uh, 12,000, uh, over 12,000 people, employees have continued to be paid each month via uh, 56 payrolls, bearing in mind that um, not only do we pay uh, our own uh, employees, but also we run payrolls uh, for a number of um, uh, schools and uh, a number of voluntary um, organisations. So, so that's what that 56 um, represents. Um, also of, um, that of interest will be that um, we've continued to um, manage vacancies. Um, so 284 vacancies have uh, been managed. We've um, issued 394 contracts. We've undertaken 955 uh, DBS checks and also produced a digital learning guide. In terms of support, um, in terms of um, apprenticeships, we have continued with our apprenticeships um, only um, 12 have been paused during this period and um, we've continued to provide um, support to schools and also um, uh, uh, we've, we've put in place a number of um, um, support mechanisms for um, employees. Of particular note will be the fact that in the last few weeks we've had um, information or evidence emerging from um, our public health um, um, in 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 England about the impact of COVID on um, uh, BAME communities, and also we have taken uh, steps to ensure, um, as a result of that information emerging, that we put some um, engagement sessions in place um, specifically aimed at um, at BAME employees, and uh, all of the sessions that we have put in place have been taken up. So so that's all all very positive. Um, and then final um, issues around support, we have um, offered coaching sessions and remote uh, learning sessions and um, a number of those have been taken up. The last bit of the um, uh, infograph, uh, if I just um, try and um, sort this on the screen. So I know that members were interested in, so how has the um, sickness absence um, uh, in, data been, um, what has been the impact of COVID on um, sickness absence? Um, as, as you can see, there's 139 employees with COVID uh, related absences. And this is just a period between the 23rd of March and the 30th of April. So we've just captured that that um, period to give you a snapshot of, of, of the impact. What we have seen for that period is that there's been a significant decrease in sickness compared to previous years. Um, some of the uh, directorates have seen a significant increase. So um, Regeneration and Enterprise and Children's Services have seen a significant uh, decrease. Sorry, did I say increase? Significant decrease in, um, in sickness absence. And also the total um, uh, days lost to sickness during this period has de decreased by 52%. Um, so, so that information um, is there for members, but also bear in mind that, uh, you know, there may have been people who will have had sickness this time last year due to, due to um, coughs and colds, um, which are, um, or, 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 or symptoms that are very similar to those that we would um, ask people to be in self-isolation for during the COVID period. So, so we just need to bear that in mind. So, that is it, I think, in terms of all the information I wanted to, to share. I'll pause um, again, Chair, if there's any questions. And then, as I said, um, uh, Matt Williams is, is, is on hand to talk to members in a bit more detail about how we're um, um, tackling that balance between having people back in the workplace who need to be and, um, and arrangements we're putting in place for those who continue to work from home. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie, and um, thank you because we didn't. I didn't have much time to get this together. I hope people have found it useful. Um, for me, on the sickness absence stuff and the sickness, um, the one question that I almost dread to ask in some ways is: um, I know you put the twenty third of March to the thirtieth of April, but have we had any of our members of staff deceased because of COVID? Um, because I, I haven't seen anything that, that has advised of that. So that's the one point I'd make. Um, the other thing is that I wonder if some of the decrease, particularly, I mean, I, I can pick up children's services because I had a lot to do with that in, in my past uh, within the council. Um, the decrease in the number of people taking sickness um, 
could part of that be down to the fact that um, a lot of the more difficult um, conversations that people would have had with children uh, and the, the fact that we haven't been doing much face to face work, could that have meant that people weren't so stressed um, with the work that I've been doing? And I think that's something that we need to bear in mind in that when the lockdown stops or, or when life becomes more normal, whatever that is in the future, we may very well see a spike in those people with identified mental health problems, particularly amongst children. Um, the, you know, the, this concept of them all suddenly returning to school in September, whilst not taking account of the fact that um, many of the children are scared witless about going back to school in any way. A lot of them are looking forward to it, but a lot of scared about this. And I think we just need to be aware that that could have quite a dramatic impact on our staff working with there. And of course, then we've got all of the other staff who are doing the sort of um, non-urgent um, domiciliary care work, um, who may not have been doing some of that work. So I just think we need to bear that in mind when we look at these stats, um, because sickness in, our, in, our, in my part of the, the world in the civil service has dropped dramatically. Um, you know, um, part of it is because you're at home anyway, if you've got a cough and a snivel, you, you, you're not going to say, I'm not going to work today because I've got a cough and a snivel, are you? So I just think, I think we need to bear that in mind if you want to come back on that. And then I would be interested uh, in Matt giving us a brief overview of what we're doing in terms of um, tr starting to move people back into work and the types of risk assessments we're having to do. And I think pertinent to what Peter said, um, in terms of the impact of not being able to fit so many people into the offices we have within our bigger town centres. Okay. I can't see anybody else raising their hand at the moment. So if you could come back on that quickly, Jackie, and then Matt come in. Un un unmute. Yes, that would help, wouldn't it? Um, so, so, so just to say, I was I'm aware that we've um, that there was um, uh, sadly one person who uh, was working in a school uh, early on um, who who had passed away, but we're not aware of um, of, of any others. Um, but but I'd, I'd need to just um, satisfy myself that you know nothing's happened in the last. Uh, um, week or so that I'm not aware of so um so that's the first thing and then I think you're absolutely right uh, around you know if you're at home and you've got a cold and you're sneezing you, you don't you know you, you you can manage that um whereas you know that there are certain um illnesses that people would have where they wouldn't want to go into the office and um and potentially infect other people and I, and I think that, that 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 probably has had an impact um on 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 the sickness figures as well and in terms of the social services side of things, you know, with the children, the mental health stuff, I think we just will you be looking at how that then peaks up um, as we move back into them being out in doing that work? Yes, absolutely. I, um, one of the, the, the strong messages that I would want to convey um, uh, to, to members is that, you know, the focus on the health and, and well-being of, of our employees is paramount. And uh, one of the things that has, has come back from the employee surveys about um, making sure that we um, don't lose sight of that, because often you think about it during a crisis. But but actually, I think in terms of our preparations for returning to the workplace, we we, we are factoring in the fact that people will have um, uh, there's, there's been a number of things that would have impacted on people's uh, mental health and well-being including you know if you're at home with a couple of kids and you've had to teach you know make sure that they're doing their lessons and everything else for, for, for 12 weeks and trying to hold down um, a job um, but, but also the, the issues of isolation you know any bereavements that people will have suffered during this period as well and not being able to um, grieve in the normal way so there's a host of things that we have factored in um, that, that we need to make sure we continue to um, prioritise uh, um, support for health and, 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 and well-being of our employees, both in terms of them returning back to the workplace, but also perhaps returning in, back to, to, to um, work that they might not have um, been involved in um, for, 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 for a number of weeks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jackie. Matt, do you want to pop in on this? Hello, everybody. Hiya, Chair. Hello, everybody. Okay. Um, 
I'm not new. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, you can't get rid of me. <laughs> um, first of all, can I just send Kevin's apologies? He's dropped out, so uh, and he's having technical difficulties, so uh, he may struggle to return. Um, so uh, the work that we're doing, uh, just to explain where it all fits in, now it links into strategic executive board. Um, you'll all be uh, familiar with uh, Balcor, who uh, who's the acting director of uh, public health. Um, Bal um, is, is taking the lead right from the start with her group, obviously dealing with the outbreak um, uh, and, 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 and tackling the pandemic, giving advice and reporting back to the council. Um, we're now picking up a baton, the group that I, uh, I lead on, which is all about returning back to work. Um, and in the long term, it's all task and finish. In the long term, that baton will probably be handed to a group who will lead on the future council, which which will be very much about what we've been talking about previously this evening, what the new council will look like. So that just puts the whole thing into context. But there's, there's a very clear message that um, I need to make. What we're trying to do here is to get people back to work, not necessarily get people back into council buildings. Um, and uh, uh, there, are, there are two main reasons for that, really. Initially, it was all about risk. Yeah, people are better off staying at home. They were safer initially sa staying at home until we could get the buildings uh, COVID safe. But it's also building a foundation uh, for the future. And we've already spoken about this, um, uh, particularly um, Councillor Barnett. Um, this is a brand new world and um, we can't really afford for it to, to, to get back to the status quo. And at the moment, we've, 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 you know, we've, we've, we've got a clean slate, as it were, with, with the majority of our workforce working from home. Are they working from home um, effectively? Well, yes, yes, they, they are. You know, we, we, we've discussed today, we've, we've, got a, we've got a call center, for goodness sake, operating from home. We never thought that would happen, but it's it, it's working. So we're reasonably effective and we're reasonably efficient. Uh, but we have to acknowledge that we're going through an, in, uh, 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 an interim phase where it's not going to be perfect, but we're trying to make it perfect by getting people in the right place. So what we've done, um, we've rag, effectively rag rated um, the, surface, the service areas. Um, and we started out with a red, amber, green, as, as, as you would expect. Uh, the red group, these are the services that we really need to get back, uh, back into buildings, really, uh, because they can't operate from anywhere else uh, and they're struggling to operate from home. So we're trying to get that sorted out. We're trying to get our buildings prepared and ready, risk assessed by the end of July, July for, so we can accommodate those services. Next on the list is the Ambers. These are the services that are working quite well at home, but they, need, they do need to be in buildings every now and again. They do need regular meetings. They do need to touch base with their colleagues. So they're the, 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 the second phase of staff, and we're trying to get those back into, uh, back into buildings or back into work um, between um, the end of July and the end of September. That's our target. And then beyond that, those are the greens, and those are the greens that the 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 the, the, the services um, and clusters of staff are working quite well from home. In fact, they're probably working better from home, and we'll have to put a great deal of work in to make sure that we've got a satisfactory home working environment. And as Councillor um, uh, Barnett said, it it may not be home. It, it you know it may be another council building. It may, and this is quite radical, it may even be another council building, i.e., you know, could we have a relationship with Sanwell or some of our neighbouring colleagues, uh, neighbouring authorities, where where colleagues live in different authorities, could, could they use their facilities? That's a bit radical. We're not ready for that yet. But certainly, you know, we, we need to look at those green colleagues to make sure their needs are catered for uh, and any issues associated with working from home. And, and you know, it, 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 it may be that um, yeah, they, they need um, contact with their colleagues or that camaraderie or whatever. Those are the sort of things we need to address. So 
We've got a team at the moment. Um, once the RAG rating is completed, then our, our building services team, um, they move in and we start work on a building's risk assessment. Um, we get that partially completed and then we bring in the service users. Obviously, that risk assessment can't be done in isolation. We have to build the risk assessment around the service. Finally, and again, through management teams, local management teams, we work out if there are any vulnerable groups or vulnerable staff where we have to do uh, a personal risk assessment. And that may be a shielded group or, 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 or a BAME group where there are particular issues in relation to COVID um, that we have to take into account. So once we've got all those risk assessments done, we then start uh, work on transforming the workplace. And again, a lot of that work is going on at the moment. And that is to make the workplace COVID safe. So a lot of, um, a lot of work in relation to um, uh, social distancing, to make sure we are work, still working to a two metre rule because that is, yeah, that we know that is safe. Uh, but we also know in, in places that may, may be slightly compromised. But we're making our offices and our workplaces uh, COVID safe. Once that work is done, we then send in our health and safety team as auditors, for want of a better expression, just to give it that second glance to make sure it's ready. Once that's complete, um, we have a charter. It's, it, 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 it's a piece of paper that's signed off uh, by um, a, 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 a senior council manager. Um, but it's a charter for employees and for management. And it's basically saying that uh, this workplace is safe, it's safe to operate, but there's also an obligation on the staff to look after one another. And there are a list of various things that, that you know, we, we expect staff to do in relation to their behaviour. An example would be if they're working in an agile sort of way and they're, they're on a shared desk, they should clean that desk when, they've let, when they leave it. And also in the morning when they get there, they should also perhaps clean it and use appropriate sanitisation. So we need a cooperative. We need to work as a team on this. And a lot of a lot of that fits in with our values and um, and, and, and behaviours. So we've um, we have 71 key buildings that we're working on and we've categorised every building from one to 71 and we're doing these on a priority basis we also have what we call the red plus buildings and these are the buildings where people have never gone gone home so in matt bevish's area where adult social care have been very busy obviously there have always been a few people in those offices three five st james's road lister road uh, the depot facilities they've you know, been reasonably operational throughout the uh, the uh, outbreak so we're having to do retrospective work in those areas just to just to check that everything that's been done previously um, when there's a, a, a deal of guess, a, a guesswork going on, that everything has been done safely. So we're doing some retrospective checks as well in relation to the Red Plus buildings. But then, as I said, we're looking forward for the Brave New World and part of the group's work will be centering on what the future will look like and indeed, you know, um, we've probably all enjoyed those of us who are travelling into work. Um, it's a yeah, lot less traffic on the road, a uh, lot less, a lot less pollution on the road. And these are really the, these. I suppose that you could you could term these as the silver lining, really, of COVID. We know it's a bad thing. We know it's a terrible thing, but there are some opportunities on the back of COVID, and 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 perhaps part of the COVID world that we want to keep. So. Um, you know, we probably have got too many buildings. Uh, and again, on the back of, of, of COVID, um, yeah, the, the, there is a likelihood that certainly some of the buildings that we lease at the moment, we can let those leases drop. drop. Um, even simple things like telephone handsets. Everybody's using these headphones now. Um, you know, do we need so many head, head, um, handsets? You know, we could literally save a hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of, of, of pounds um, on a, a lot of old technology that that basically has suddenly become outdated. And again, to put that into context, we yeah, prior to COVID, we were doing some future council work. What would the council look like in 2030? And in terms of agile, we thought, well, you know, the chances of getting 2,000 staff working from home would be highly unlikely. That you know, that our chances of changing that culture would be um, would, would would be very much an uphill struggle. And yet we pretty much did that overnight. 
which is amazing, really. Uh, admittedly, yeah, we've got to backtrack a bit and 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 do some uh, and do some work on, on the culture to make it sustainable. But we've achieved an awful lot in a very short um, period of time. So I'll um, through you, Chair. I'll leave it at that. But quite happy to take uh, questions. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Brian, you got your hand up. Yes. Yes, thank you. Matt, Matt just touched on what I wanted to say, but I need to cancel my hand going up because Matt had said it. One thing we complain about every day is congestion on the roads. And this is why it's going to be so important in the future that people do work from home and also the toxic fumes. That is going to be a big um, improvement on that. So, But Matt did just catch on, to, uh, talk about that um, towards the end. So, yes, that is one one plus about working, well, a, a, a big plus from working from home. Thanks, Brian. Um, just, I, I just want to make the point that actually um, we've got, we've used a saying that one of our managers, um, I thought it was brilliant. He said, um, we're not working from home. We're working at home in a crisis. And it's very different. And I think um, one of the things that, that, that um, will be very different is being able to go out of your house after this is over um, because I think one of, the, one of the things which is making this really quite surreal for some is the fact that you work, you're stuck in your house all day working at home uh, you then don't go out apart from maybe a little bit of exercise for some people who are shielding that's been almost impossible as well so we get a new idea of what the norm is in terms of working from home once we, once the covid aspect of it is out of the way and um I, i'm I, I make no bones of it. I'm a union rep um, dealing with the West Midlands um, for for the civil service, and um, what we're finding is that uh, there are a lot of people now who are desperate to go back to work. Uh, they're missing. Uh, they feel so ice missing people. They feel very isolated, um, and actually, many of them, their health is deteriorating quite quickly in terms of not, not getting any exercise whatsoever. Um, so that's one of the the other points about this, and it, I think you mentioned the the one to one aspect of this. Um, we need to look at the individual when we look at all of these things, and and it is a whole new world for us, as you said. You know, 2030 we might have expected maybe this many overnight will change dramatically our working practices. And and the one thing I would the other thing I'd like to say before I bring in Chris and, and Pete is. Um, the council, like the civil service, I've always seen as um, an employer who can show how we best treat our employees, how we follow the rules, how we make how we've made those rules as we've, as we've gone along. And one of the things I'd like to, to do is to be able to see how we share with the employers out there who don't have that same organisational capability as us um, the way forward on these sort of issues um, because we should be doing that rather than having the race to the bottom which unfortunately is being shown in some firms isn't it um, with, with with what's going on at the moment particularly in Leicester and, and other places and um, we should be looking at how do we uh, increase the working life make better the working lives of, of the people that work in our borough so right um, Chris I think you were first and then Peter after that thanks chair um yeah, just to pick up on two things there. First of all, um, the whole co-working facility idea and, um, you, you know, and, and continuing to work uh, uh, from home. The, the opportunity there, of course, uh, is, uh, well, there's, there's more opportunity for Dudley Council uh, for employing people who are further afield and maybe, you know, they're too far afield to, to come in. So there's more talent available. And also there's a whole raft of people who are currently their, their disabilities prevent them from attending an office. And uh, I've often wondered just how, you know, if you were sorry to use such a, an obvious thing, but if you're confined to a, a wheelchair, um, if you've got to get to a job, I mean, first of all, you managed to get a job, which I suspect there's some prejudice against that. And it, it's, a, it's a good you, you've uh, been uh, remarkable in the first place. Not necessarily in the council, I mean, I mean, in the wider world. Um, you, you've then got to drag yourself across the city on public transport or whatever to get yourself to a desk for nine o'clock and then do the whole thing in reverse um, when, when you're finished. Um, I, I don't know, I, I'd sound like I'm tired already, personally. I don't know how you do the eight hours of work in between. 
Um, but obviously there's an opportunity there to em employ people who are otherwise uh, quite, um, uh, the, you know, they have all, all the value of being able to work, but the difficulties that make them, them uh, difficult to employ in certain locations. And, and the other thing, Tim, uh, that you picked up on there is I really feel it's a, a massive opportunity for Dudley Council to set the example for the wider borough and show other employers that, uh, you, know, you know, how it's done and, and how it can be done well. Um, I'll, I'll show up about co-working now because I can talk about it all day. But uh, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Pete? Pete, sorry, Peter, not Pete. Yep. Unmute yourself, yep. Peter. Yep, yeah, I, no, no, I'm just a little bit slow. Um, yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, just to reiterate, really, on uh, what Matt said, um, yeah, it, 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 it is great for a lot of people, I believe, to work from home. You know, I, I think it's a great idea, but I'm just a little bit concerned if a vast majority of people were told to work from home or chose to work from home, that it may be a little bit like our high streets, towns, and that it become a little bit ghost towny. And that worries me because it doesn't always work, does it? This, uh, I mean, a lot of people are, on, are online buying now, so the, the small shops are closing down. Mary Hill is in crisis. I mean, there's a, a classic example. So it does concern me about the fact that a lot more people would want to work from home. But I understand fully that it may suit a lot of people, and i, I I welcome that if uh, if by any medical reason you need to work from home. What a great idea for people to feel part of society, you know, to be able to do that. So that was just it, really. And, and yes, I think you have to look at the traffic, don't you, as well? I mean, I'm a builder. I've got a small building company. And uh, travelling on the roads is a delight now because everybody's either first load or the kids are not at school so it's a brilliant thing to be able to get on the roads and to around and not to be held up uh, and at that point then it becomes a nightmare for me being a builder trying to get materials from a yard that doesn't want to let you in the yard and they're all standing there you go back home <laughs> with the masks on um, but there you go that's life so oh, thanks chair for that that was all I wanted to say thanks Ed Thank you. and then I'll bring Matt back in yeah, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to ask Matt if, if any extra resource had been put into IT. Obviously, all this working from home is 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 fun, IT fundamental, isn't it? Um, and also, how is this going to affect? You know, we talked. I think it's about twelve months ago about digital transformation. It, it's expedited it, hasn't it? But obviously, that's going to cost a lot of money. Um, and and whether it'd be worth having some input from IT at, at future meetings. And I hold my hand up. I work in IT in the daytime, so uh, you know I think they're the unsung heroes in all this. Thanks, Ed. Uh, and uh, just before you come in, Matt, I, I've got to say, um, yeah, the way that we've managed to get our systems to work and work so well, it's been really quite a surprise, hasn't it? And 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 it must mean that our IT specialists have actually pulled 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 it off this time, haven't they? So yeah, Matt, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I, I, I'd like to echo that. Um, our ICT uh, team have been fantastic. There, there were some bits of um, software um, to enable us to work from home that they introduced very, very quickly. Uh, but as a council, uh, we, were, we were quite a way down the Agile uh, working programme anyway. So luckily, a lot of staff had already got laptops. But off the top of my head, I think we, we got hold of at least an extra 250 laptops within a matter of weeks. So that plugged quite a big gap. Um, uh, and yet it has cost money, uh, but the um, the government have recognised uh, that and uh, we've got additional funding. Whether it's enough, uh, enough or not, you know, I, 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 I can't be the judge of that, but certainly um, we've spent a lot on the uh, COVID crisis on many things and uh, ICT is but one of them. Uh, but it's it's definitely the future. I know that sounds a bit twee, um, but without um, without the infrastructure we've got, we couldn't be doing what we're doing. And I come back to the fact that we have got a call centre working from home. And, you know, who'd have thought we could have done that six months ago? 
but we've done it. But it's just a start. I think we recognise that our customers, the people that we serve, a, a, a great deal of them will not be IT savvy. So we, we, we really need to work back to make sure that people can uh, not only get in touch with us, but um, get access to council services. Um, you know, we, 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 we can't afford to get too far ahead. We need to take everybody with us on this on this revolution, for want of a better expression. But it's it's definitely a way the, to go, and it's it's the foundation of everything that we're doing at the moment. So yeah, you know, I, I think Councillor Lawrence has made a very good point. All right. Thanks, Ian. Um, sorry, Matt. Um, I, I'd just like to say thank you. Uh, and can you? I mean, I, I, I don't know how the committee feel about this, but I, I'd like our thanks to be passed on to everybody that's been working on this. You know, we've heard from the HR people today. We've heard from yourself, Matt. Um, earlier, we heard from the procurement side of things. You know. Um, there's so many people been doing enormous amounts of work for the people that we serve. And, um, you know, I would have expected, and I think it's been quite surprising, the lack of complaints from the public about the services that we've been providing. We've had some, but, you know, we always get some. But to some extent, I would have expected it to have peaked. And actually, it hasn't. Um, things like, you know, I, I went to the tip. It worked. You know, uh, I could get there. I could, I could do the things I needed to. It wasn't too difficult to do. So I, I really think we, uh, from from the committee um, overall, we should be thanking the staff that work for us uh, uh, and for all the work they've done. So thanks, Matt. Um, really good, interesting report. Um, I think we'd like to know how it goes along. As, uh, uh, so we'll probably invite you along. Well, when you've got something to say about how it's, you know, how we're doing. Um, and for me, I, I just think it's. Um, really weird times as you said there's bonuses isn't there to some of this it's a sad thing to think there are bonuses but um yep yeah, it's, it's going okay right so um the next item on the agenda i think we're at folks and that is hold on um chair sorry just before you move on um rose um has just put in the chat facility if um if you want to to, to come in on that last point he discussed and also with um councillor cottrell um, has got his hand raised as well. Oh, sorry, I, I, I missed that. Yeah, um, Brian, do you want to come in first, and then Rose? Uh, I thought I thought I'd let Rose off. <laughs> yeah. Is, is Matt staying with us for the rest of the meeting? Um, because if not, I would like to raise a point now on um, recycling waste. But if Matt is staying for the meeting, do, do, it, do it now, Brian. Because um, can I do it now? I mean, yeah, through yeah, you, yeah. Chair. I am. I am around for the rest of the meeting. So do it. You know, it's, it's no, up to you. Do it. Do it now, because you're on now, Brian. You might as well. Yes. Okay. I would just like to ask Matt this. I, I saw a very disturbing report on television a few nights ago because I've been in lockdown and watched a lot of television. But what I did see was most disturbing: re unrecycled waste. And what it was, where our recycled waste goes to when when it's collected, uh, do we recycle it here in the borough or do we ship it off or transport it off elsewhere? Because what it showed, I don't know if anybody else on the committee saw this report on television, it is shipped to Turkey where it is supposed to be recycled, but they haven't the facilities to recycle, so they're burning it there sending black toxic smoke up into the air. So does Matt know where our recycled waste goes to? Uh, through, through you, Chair. Uh, thanks for that, Brian. <laughs> um, so off the top of my head, uh, I, I will get back to you with uh, some more up-to-date uh, data on this, but uh, off the top of my head, uh, our glass goes to Pontefract, our paper goes to Ashford in Kent, and I think most of our plastics are um, are dealt with locally. Uh, last year, we did uh, send some of our recycling to Belgium uh, as part of a contract. That's that's our only venture outside the uh, the UK, and and that 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 that, that, that we went to a you know a, a bona fide, very good recycling facility that was purely done on cost. Um, I believe now uh, with our latest contract, everything's back in the UK, but certainly we've never been to Turkey. Uh, we've uh, we've never been to um, India, uh, China, 
um, uh, nothing, uh, nothing in the uh, in the Asian region. A lot of a lot of these places um, that you do see on the news, you know, we've we've just never been there. The um, yeah, we we we've, we've never ventured outside the EU, and we only did that once, and that was really um, more about price than anything else. So, um, but and it was you know a, a, you know, a reputable um, uh, recycling company that had good working practice in line with European legislation. I hope that uh, hope that helps. Thanks, Matt. Um, uh, uh, right, um, Brian, you can switch switches off off now, mate. Uh, he's still he's not looking bad for an olden, really, is he, Brian? Cheers, mate. Just click your video, turn your camera off. Good lad. Right, um, we've we've got one item of the agenda left, folks. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention the baggies before anything ha else happens today. Um, they're on in tw 15 minutes, I think. So I was hoping to get this done by then. So uh, I hope we still do. It's up to be me that shuts up then. Um, right, we've got one item left on the agenda, which is the corporate um, scrutiny course um, annual report. Um, I'm hoping that everybody's seen this um, and I want to thank the officers for putting it together. Um, it's a shame um, that COVID's happened for so many different reasons because actually I think um, we didn't do too badly over this past year in what we've we've scrutinized or scrutinized. Um, so I just wanted any comments for anybody about this um, but otherwise I'd like us just to, to pass the report. So has anybody co got any comments about the um, that item. Did I need to bring anybody else in that in that Karen? Did you have to say anything or, or Steve? No, that's fine, Chair. Just if anybody's got any comments or questions yeah. on that. Ooh, look at that. There's none. I, I just as I, said, I want to thank the officers. I think at least we're showing we've got a report which goes to council now that actually shows what we've tried to do during this past year. And I want to um, I suppose really we'd have had an annual council. I might not be doing what I'm doing. We're stuck with where we are, but um, I hope that over this next six months uh, we're able to help the council by scrutinising uh, some of the things that come forward. And um, I know that Sue, Sue Greenaway asked for an item to go on the um, agenda. And what I've said is if we put that on the next as an item on the next agenda, is there anything that anybody um, it, sorry, if there's anything that anybody wants brought up at the next agenda, can you please let us know? Um, you know, and that's anything really, um, because uh, it, it's your committee. Um, we've got an agenda setting exercise that is going to take place as the chairs and vice chairs, I believe that's going to take place later in July or maybe early August. I'm not sure Steve will know that. Steve, just, I'm trying to keep you awake, you see. Um, yep, have we yes, actually got that meeting going to take place? We have, Chair. It's in the diary for later in July, before yeah. the council meeting. Oh, it's before the council meeting, right. So, so yeah, there'll, there'll be, um, uh, that will be setting the agenda for the next year. So if you've got any ideas, please let me know. Um, for me, I think a standing item on, on the agenda should be um, how the council is changing to take account of um, the, the impact of COVID. I think that would be very very useful to know i think something was just mentioned about the ict and i think the link between the ict and the covid side of it i think that's there um i would like um because uh, the chief executive's got away with it again tonight um and and i wasn't at the last meeting I, i'd like the chief executive to come to um our next meeting maybe or, or even the one afterwards just to explain how he um looks at things corporately because we're the corporate scrutiny committee um, so there's a, two or three th items, but if people have got other things, can you please let Steve know or Karen? OK. Everybody happy with the annual report? Say no if you're not. We've got Brian Cottrell, uh, Chair. Sorry, I, I didn't realise. I thought he'd left his hand up from the last time. No, I'm not. No, no, he's not. No. Oh, so are you back on again, Brian? No, he's not. <laughs> Hey, I'll tell you, Brian, you've done really well, mate, on this because it's, it's a new system for everybody. And um, I think I think you've done exception, exceptionally well in managing to get your video and then get yourself off. Um, right. So, uh, colleagues, um, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you to the officers for the work that they've done to put this forward. And please keep yourself safe and well. And um, let's hope the baggies win tonight. OK, so good night to you all.
Good night. Thanks. Good night, Chair. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.